Hi, I'm Samantha Ratnam, the leader of the Victorian Greens. It seems like transport is shaping up to be a major issue at this state election, with a lot of the parties um, have committed to major projects. Mm. What, what areas are you focusing on in the area of transport? Well, we're glad to see that public transport is becoming a key issue in this election, and I think that's because the Greens have put it front and centre of the agenda. For many years now, we've been championing better public transport for years and uh, took a big comprehensive plan to the last election as well. Uh, and we've been doing work in the Parliament for the last four years to make sure that it gets the investment and attention that it needs. We've outlined a number of big signature policies like extending, Mel extending Melbourne Metro, building Melbourne Metro 2, because we know that um, the Metro Tunnel Works are, are good, they're a step in the right direction, but we know that system's going to be at capacity essentially from the time it is unveiled to the public and released to the public. So we actually have to start thinking about what the next stage and the stage after is if we really are going to have a world-class public transport system System that's going to cope with the patronage. Uh, more people want to use public transport rather than having cities congested by big expensive toll roads. Uh, we'd much rather have a fantastic public transport system that meant that everyone could get where they want to go when they need to be there. So I take it that you don't support projects such as the North East <laughs> Link uh, and the Westgate Tunnel? That's right. So we've been um, speaking out against those projects and I think you have to go back even to the previous election when that disastrous East-West link was announced and we saw a community campaign like we hadn't seen before where people came out to protest this really disastrous project on a number of grounds. It was going to absolutely devastate our environment, cut through parkland, cut the city in so many different slices. And it was also not the project that we needed. Transport experts have been saying we've got to build more rail, more public transport, and here we were handing billions of dollars to a private toll road company. And then, a few years later, a project that was not taken to an election, the Westgate Tunnel, was suddenly foisted upon the Victorian people, and we raised our voices in Parliament when that came to light. It was an unsolicited bid, so basically a company can go directly to the government saying we want to build this, It'll hand huge profits and what are called super profits to Transurban. So we're seeing more and more of these projects which are not going to any public scrutiny. The public doesn't know and doesn't have a say in them and delivering huge profits to private companies. At the same time, we need those billions of dollars invested in public transport. So we, are, we don't want a future Victoria gridlocked by big toll road companies and flyover freeways. We'd much rather a better public transport system and active transport where we're reducing our carbon emissions because transport is a really big part of addressing climate change, bringing down carbon emissions too. So let's talk about public transport. Melbourne University students will be aware that um, we've, the government started working on the Melbourne Metro Tunnel mm. with a station just being yes. constructed yes. here in Parkville. Yes. Now I understand that the Greens um, have are committing funding to something called the Melbourne Metro 2. Yes. How does this fit in to the uh, proposed rail system in Victoria? Well, essentially what we need to do is start thinking about the tunnel network that needs to come post Melbourne, uh, the Melbourne Metro Tunnel. Uh, I too was a student at uni Melbourne University for many years and would have loved a train station uh, very close to campus. We did the trudge, you know, coming up on the train, getting the tram up Swanston Street and thousands of students every day doing that um, passage. So it's going to be really welcome to have a train station at key nodes like universities as well. Melbourne Metro 2 starts thinking about what the next level of tunnel work that needs to happen and starting to link um, a number of areas, you know, fish, we've got Fisherman's Bend, you've got um, areas in, in the north in Clifton Hill that are not surfaced properly at the moment and you've, uh, Melbourne Metro 2 starts to think about that next level of uh, tunnel work that needs to happen to really build that next layer of the public transport system. We want a Victoria, uh, Melbourne and a Victoria that's connected, really connected by a high speed, uh, sorry, a, a more faster frequent public transport system. So in this space, um, Labor have proposed the suburban rail mm. loop. What's the green stance on this project? We welcome anything that will help our public transport system improve. And I think what was really interesting about that announcement was it signalled 
that public transport was on the agenda. And uh, we're really glad to see that. We have been championing it for years and community groups and transport experts have been championing it for years. And I think you're starting to see more of these announcements by other parties because they recognise they can't ignore it. And I think that our successive state governments previously have underinvested and neglected public transport and we've got more road projects planned than public transport projects. So it's a lot of catch up. But we're glad and uh, we're, it's better late than never. Uh, so we welcome um, any new projects. One of the things that we're worried about, though, is a lot of these projects don't start for many years to come, decades, in fact. So I don't think Melbourne and Victoria can wait till 2050 to see better public transport systems, which is why we've introduced a number of proposals that um, traverse trams, trains and buses to ensure that we get improvements immediately because we're feeling the problems now. We're feeling the system that's not coping right now. And I can tell you that we speak to lots of people and people speak to us a lot about the overcrowding and congestion and the lack of services and the, um, uh, the services that are cancelled and unreliable currently that they want improved immediately. So we welcome the long term thinking. It's really important. It'd be good to see a bit more detail. Those projects need lots of scrutiny, but we also need action now. So aside from Melbourne Metro 2, what are some immediate ways you think we can increase the frequency yep. and reduce the congestion on our roads? Well, we've been uh, introduced uh, in, throughout our policies, where we've introduced things in a number of ways, trains, trams and buses. But if you think about trams, for example, um, and uh, significant investment in buying more trams, so you get more trams on the network, so you, then you can increase your uh, frequency and services. Building more accessible tram stops, where you start to actually change the way your cities uh, work with public transport. Accessibility is so important. Our public transport system is inaccessible in so many ways, so it's really important for people with different mobility needs that they have access to the uh, public transport system. So building accessible super stops is a really important part of doing that, and we've announced a significant amount of money to be able to do build more of those stops as well. And what we'd love to be able to see is our cities and our neighbourhoods start to really think about how they build their cities, where tra public transport and active transport, like cycling and walking, is actually planned for first, rather than thinking about how do you get as many cars as you possibly can through a particular area, which is, I think, where cities have gone wrong. We've built them for cars, not for people. So the Greens are known for their focus on environment mm. and climate change. How does your policy in this area compare to the other major parties? The Greens have been champions for the environment. It uh, was a reason for being and, you know, uh, where the Greens movement really established themselves now over two decades ago uh, and championed um, huge environmental causes, starting from the rivers in Tasmania and beyond. And uh, issues like climate change are issues, uh, are the reasons why people like me came into the Greens because I got so concerned about what was happening with climate change and the inaction our politicians and parliaments were taking on it that I thought we have to do something about it and we have to do that now. So we have led the way in pushing for a greater acceleration in moving towards renewable energy and bringing down our carbon emissions. We've seen with the recent IPCC report, for example, that the need to move to renewables and get carbon emissions down is more urgent than ever. Uh, and we really face quite significant global catastrophe if we don't do something very significant. So in Victoria, for example, we want to see the phase out of coal. We've got a government that has started to make some moves in the right direction towards renewables. We really welcome that. And I think, once again, that's thanks to the really significant environmental movement. It's thanks to having Greens in positions in local government, state government and federal government that we're getting um, those other parties to move in that direction because we're putting a lot of pressure on them. So we're seeing them start to build more or commit to more renewable energy. Uh, and we welcome the renewable energy target. We think that it needs to move much more quickly. And you can't say in one way, we want to move to renewables and keep burning fossil fuels if you're serious about climate change. So we're the only ones who are talking about a phase out of coal and fossil fuel burning with a plan that's matched with it as well. We think we're talking about solar, not just for people who own homes, and it's really important that more people have access to solar, but people who rent, who at the moment aren't able to access renewable energy as easily, and thinking about new ways we can get more renewable energy onto the grid. Can the uh, Victorian government achieve these targets without a national framework in place? Particularly with regard to the fact that Victoria provides mm. a lot of base load power to the mm. national energy market. Mm. Where would we sit then in this 
renewables mm. framework. It would be ideal to have a really uh, ambitious national framework, but we have seen our federal governments let us down in this regard, you know, year after year, and it's quite devastating to see that. I was in local government before I came into state government, and I remember us talking about this in terms of what a local community can do. When you see your state and federal governments refuse to act, what can you do as a local community who's so concerned about these global problems? And we took that responsibility very seriously, and we said, we're going to do everything we possibly can. We might not have the leadership at the other levels, but we're going to try and show as much leadership as possible. And I take the same view in state parliaments as well. I think we all have a responsibility to do as much as we possibly can. It would be great to have those frameworks. One of our jobs is to push, put pressure on the federal government as well to come up with those good national frameworks. But we're seeing what you can do at a state and a local level. The Melbourne Renewable Energy Project that's just been unveiled, um, you know, the big wind, uh, wind power station where local councils and key institutions and Melbourne University, I believe, is a partner as well, coming together to build renewable energy. And they're the game changers. They interrupt the old ways we used to do things. And get more renewable energy onto the market. So states can really lead the way. We've seen that with South Australia, taking some big moves in the right direction, showing leadership. So I think it's about showing leadership and with Greens in Parliament, we can push that to the next level by accelerating the renewable energy target and phasing out of coal. Now, it seems that the Great Forest National Park is a key part of your environment platform. Can you explain what this policy is? Certainly. Right now, we've got so much of our beautiful native forests that are being logged, uh, and it's been incredible to be in the parliament for the last year when my colleagues, and particularly my colleague Samantha Dunn, who is an incredible forest campaigner and a parliamentarian with, um, you know, the fo fo forest as her focus, has been championing uh, the end to the logging of our native forests. Not, not many people know um, that we are logging those native forests there. We've got beautiful native forests right across Victoria in the highlands and the areas we're talking about in terms of the Great Forest National Park and the Emerald Link. We've got these beautiful mountain ash forests that need to be preserved. They are the water supply of Melbourne. They're the lungs of our cities. And yet we've got timber companies, we've got governments who seem to be so close to these companies and we're trying to understand what the rationale is when you're going to actually you, we're going to lose that timber supply as well. So you lose your forest, you lose your timber supply, and it's a lose-lose situation, and it's an environmental disaster. We want to see the Great Forest National Park created and the Emerald Link created, which is a large swathe of um, beautiful uh, uh, forests, native forests, uh, and it's important for so many reasons. It's really important that our future generations have forests to enjoy, but it's really important for our climate system too. If we're going to keep carbon emissions down, if we're going to protect Victoria's water supply, we must stop logging these native forests. What would this mean for Victoria's forestry industry? We've got a transition package uh, and quite a comprehensive package about how we can transition and plantation timber is already on the market. And it's been really interesting in the parliament to see those issues debated when you talk about the fact that we have plantations timber that could supply that industry why we continue to, for, um, to forest, deforest the native forests, which take hundreds of years to reforest, if ever. You lose all the undergrowth and that whole ecology that goes with it. And if you haven't gone, I would highly recommend that you go and visit the area of the Great Forest National Park, which is earmarked, and we hope will become the Great Forest National Park, because once you go there and you see that forest and you feel that forest, you will never look at it the same way again. It's a whole ecological system that needs to be preserved and protected for the wildlife, for the, the, um, the uh, plant life that a big forest system like that protects. Recently, when you, recently uh, you announced a plan to end the pokies. Yes. What does this plan entail? And given that a lot of other states and parties uh, in state elections recently in South Australia and Tasmania have uh, announced a similar plan um, but haven't been successful in being elected and then legislating this plan. Mm. It seems like it's going to be a tough one for the mm. Victorian Greens. Well, we're really concerned about the impact that pokies have on our community and the devastation and harm they cause us. I was, as I said, was a local government before and we saw firsthand the impact that pokies cause in communities. In each community, you're looking at tens of millions of dollars. In Moreland, where I was at before, $65 million a year that goes into those pokies 
over two and a half billion dollars across Victoria. And that's money that's not staying in communities. Instead, it's money that's actually devastating people's lives emotionally and financially. And then communities have to pick up the tab. Local councils trying to put in support services to help people. The Victorian government then has to put in millions, if not billions of dollars to support services to pick up the pieces that this industry causes. And we know these machines are designed to be um, as addictive and alluring as possible. So it's quite a predatory industry as well. So we've spoken about it for years and community opposition to these pokies is really growing. So community sentiment is absolutely on our side and people want pokies out of our communities. Uh, ourselves and our community clubs, our footy clubs, were not ever supposed to be mini casinos, but that's essentially what they're becoming. So we've announced our plan to phase out the pokies over the next 10 years. Uh, and what that would mean is that current licenses go for another four years. They would have one more option of a six year license, but the local council and therefore the local community is represented through the council, would determine which of those licenses would be extended for that six year period. So you might have communities that are ready to get out right now, and in four years they say that's it to the pokies, or some communities who have a more staggered transition plan. As part of that plan, there's $200 million that will go to support those clubs who need to transition out of the pokies to reprogram other types of activities. Very sadly, as well, we heard stories of, uh, for example, our multicultural community clubs who said that when the pokies were introduced, they've seen how the activity in their clubs changed. They said it used to be a place where people come and talk about the old days and talk to each other and connect with people and really break through social isolation and you know really build community. And they said since the pokies have come in, People are you know, sitting on those machines, people don't come in to do those old chats anymore, and their actual clubs have turned into something else. And they want the pokies out so that they can return to the work that they once were supposed to do, and that's the reason they were there for in the first place. Uh, so we've got lots of support from the community for this proposal, and it's been interesting to see what's happened in other states. And what we have seen in other states is when anyone has outlined any ambitious policy towards um, reforming uh, to, to address gambling harm, and particularly the pokies, you get the gambling industry, which is a pretty predatory industry and a pretty powerful industry, throw all its weight in trying to fight um, fight that reform. We've seen that in Victoria over the last couple of weeks as well, with the association that's supposed to represent community clubs uh, basically issuing a call to all its members to vote for anyone else but the Greens because we have the strongest gambling reform policies. Now your policy would keep poker machines at Crown Casino. Yeah. There have been allegations against Crown Casino about pokies tampering mm. and other mispractices within Victoria's gambling yeah. um, regulations framework. Uh, can we trust the casino to be to have an effective monopoly on this uh, form of entertainment and gambling? Well, we would love to uh, bring in harm reduction measures right across the board. And part of our package was also introducing harm reduction measures. So we know that, for example, introducing a dollar bets, maximum upload limits, mandatory pre-commitment can actually really have an impact. And we got that costed and we think it's the first costing of its nature in Victoria. And it actually demonstrated that it would be really effective in less money being poured into the pokies and therefore into the pokies industry, flowing from Victorians' pockets into the pokies industry. We'd love to introduce those harm reduction measures into Crown. But we found out that um, basically because of a deal, a sweet sweetheart deal that was done four years ago at the eve of the last uh, state election, uh, there was a piece of legislation that was rushed through the parliament which essentially locks in Crown's profits and it basically offers them a $200 million compensation package should their profits be affected by any of these kind of measures like harm reduction. Uh, so we're trying to do as much as we possibly can to expose that deal. We've been asking lots of questions in the parliament about why Crown gets special treatment. It is allowed to, it essentially got to set its own tax rate so it actually pays a lot less tax for its pokies than other community clubs do. And that's because of all that legislation and that package. It's also got provisions about how it can um, change its machines, like you talked about in terms of that tampering stuff, on the floor of its casino and exempt itself from the other rules that other venues are supposed to abide by. So it's one rule for Crown, it's another rule for everyone else. It has to be exposed and we've been really calling them out on it. Would changing these laws and regulations uh, within the conditions of the Crown licence put up the Victorian government for any compens compensation to be paid to Crown Casino and other clubs? Well, in terms of the Crown package, as I mentioned, there's a $200 million clause that's within that legislation at the moment, and I think we need to have a, have a look at that and then really think about how much 
uh, of Victorians' taxpayer taxes or how much Victorian money has been locked into contracts as part of compensation packages that have been promised to people. We saw that with you know toll road contracts as well, where governments just hand over as promises, um, you know, huge amounts of taxpayers' money, and Victorians don't like to see that at all as well. In terms of the other clubs, we're actually planning quite a a 10-year transition, so people have time to prepare, and that's why we've announced it as a 10-year package. You get to see out your current licence, and there are a lot of clubs that actually do want to get out of the pokies. This gives them plenty of time to think about how they could get out of it with, the, with some funding to help them transition as well, and we think it's absolutely achievable. Now, we've seen a quite a clear focus on law and order in this election, particularly from the Coalition. Now, this is not a policy area that I understand your platform emphasises. So what's your take on law and order? Well, it's been pretty worrying to see the kind of law and order rhetoric that has really ramped up over the last few months particularly and feels like it's, uh, for some people, it's an election, uh, kind of election ploy as well. Um, it's their way of framing what's happened, but it's a, what, we, what I really think is kind of a distraction from what's actually happening, the real issues that governments need to turn their minds uh, towards. We need to keep our communities safe and protected, and uh, that's absolutely the heart of everything that we do. We want to prevent... Um, these things from happening before they become problems. We want to set up communities and what our platform is, you know, really driven towards building healthy and livable communities, building more, pu more housing, for example, building more public housing, for example, we know goes a long way to prevent problems arising on the other end when you actually have a lack of community services. What's really worrying about the law and order agenda as well is it's been used to really pit groups of people against each other and disproportionately affect some groups over the others. For example, the last six months, we saw three pieces of legislation go through the Victorian Parliament that really targeted young people, targeted young people from different multicultural communities, allowed people to be detained for long periods of time without charge, um, uh, introduced anti-association laws, which would mean that you know young people getting together in groups would be really, really worried about whether they were breaking now this new law. And we see when that rhetoric ramps up, and we, we're seeing it as part of this cycle now, in terms of election cycles, a really conservative kind of lurch to try and get attention and get votes and try to say there's a bad guy and there's a good guy and we're going to come and, and save everything. It actually misses the point of what's actually happening in a state like Victoria. Um, we need to do a lot more in preventative services, restorative justice, keeping people, you know, making sure that they get the supports they need so people aren't cycling through the child protection system, the juvenile justice system and the adult prison system. And uh, my colleague Sue Pennicue has been doing some incredible work for years on this in terms of preventative and restorative justice. And we want future Victorian governments to actually put money into those services um, rather than just ramping up the rhetoric when it suits them politically. Now, depending on the uh, numbers in the next parliament, you've flagged a possible power sharing arrangement with Labor. Now, Labor have ruled out mm. this power sharing arrangement. So what do you think the next parliament is going to look like? Well, I think the next parliament is going to be very, very interesting. This parliament is actually very, very close if you look at the numbers um, that the whole government holds majority by. The Greens have the shared balance of power in the upper house, and with that shared balance of power, and we've been in balance of power before as well, what we do is we apply the maximum scrutiny and investigation and check and balance to every piece of legislation that goes through that parliament. We've launched inquiries. It's the reason we know that there are over 80,000 people on the waiting list for housing now because of the Greens-led inquiry into public housing. So it's really important to have Greens in parliament and the Greens have played a really important role both in Victorian and federal parliaments um, in the upper house uh, when we've had balance of power and even when we haven't actually. At this state election, it's uh, quite possible that we could hold the balance of power in both houses of parliament. We have three fantastic MPs currently in the lower house. We have the chance to add a few more to that number, which would be really great, uh, and in the upper house similarly as well. And um, we're seeing multi-party governments becoming the norm right across the world, and we're seeing them be really successful governments too. Uh, we know that when there's a contest of ideas, when there's different ideas around the table where people have to collaborate and negotiate and work together, you actually get better outcomes. So we think it could be a really successful, um, a really successful uh, form of government. We have a whole suite of progressive policies for both the community and the environment. We want Victoria to be a really, really progressive state. We know Victoria can show leadership. 
It was incredible to be part of the parliament when the first treaty legislation went through this year. We show that we can lead the way and the rest of the country can follow. So I hope the next parliament um, really is a parliament that can show great leadership in terms of both climate action and social justice. Now, a collaborative government would, of course, entail compromise. Mm. Are you prepared to compromise some of your key policy areas for the sake of a power sharing arrangement? We, um, you know, this role and this work in terms of the political sphere requires compromise every day and negotiation, but you're always working towards getting a better outcome. Uh, we would take our platform, our election platform that we have announced as the basis for any negotiations and negotiations of give and take. What we want to see though is Victoria doing better. We want our climate targets, our renewable energy targets, our phase out of coal to be accelerated. We want more public housing to be built and that waiting list of 80,000 people to be dramatically reduced. We want to ensure that we have a world-class public transport system and that integrity is at the heart of every decision that's made by any future parliaments. We've seen parliaments now at a state level and federal level plagued by scandal, people become really disenchanted with what they see, they lose trust in their politicians, and we've got a really big job to restore faith and trust and confidence in our parliaments. They can work and they can do really fantastic things, and that'll be the basis of our negotiations trying to get an even better Victoria um, through the next parliament.